Hey, welcome to Stay at Home Dads Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with you once again to the place I talk about a lot of dad stuff as well as a lot of guy stuff. Now, I just want to jump right into today's episode. I got a guest. She met with me via Zoom. Her name is Sharon. She is actually, or she was actually, my daughter's first grade teacher at her elementary school. And I asked her to come on here to mainly talk to me about how to keep kids engaged how to keep kids' education and their learning progressing throughout summer break, even winter break and fall break, all the other breaks that kids get. How do we just keep them progressing in the right direction and not having any of these backslides that happen to kids when they take a long break and then all of a sudden they get back into school and they forgot sight words and they forgot math stuff and and they forgot things that they learned the previous year. We actually have a really great conversation. We talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about education in general, learning, kids, you know, we kind of cover a lot of topics, we tell some stories. So I actually broke this conversation up into two episodes. So today is part one. Next week will be part two. So be sure to tune in for that. Um, That's it. Just sit back, relax and, and enjoy the conversation. Also, I wanted to mention my party. So some of you know that I turned 40 recently, and my wife threw me an amazing 40th party. So stay tuned for that. I'll probably talk about that here in the next few weeks. It was a blowout. She should be patting herself on the back because it was amazing. But anyways, let's go ahead and get into this content and uh, enjoy. All right. I would just like to welcome Sharon to the show. She's a first grade teacher. She's one of our local elementary school teachers. Actually, my daughter Olivia's teacher from last year. So thank you for coming on my little show here and bestowing a little bit of wisdom upon me. I'm glad to be here. (laughs) Thank you very much. And today I just wanted to (laughs) have a conversation with you about keeping our kids engaged throughout the summer break so they don't fall behind going into the next school year. And I kind of just thought it would be good to go straight to a source and you're the only local teacher that I really know. So here we are. (laughs) All right. Um, The first question I kind of had for you is how long have you been a teacher and and kind of what grades do you have experience with a little bit, kind of a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I just finished my 20th year of teaching, and I actually came to teaching a little bit later in life. I um, initially had a degree in journalism, and then I stayed home with my two boys. And when they were younger, I just decided I, I really enjoy working with children. It kind of started with teaching swimming lessons. And so then I went back to school and got my education degree and my youngest son started first grade and I, that was my first year of teaching. So that was kind of fun. So he has gone on to do many things and I've stayed in first grade. So I've only ever taught first grade. I also have a a specialty um, license in reading and in high ability education too. They call those endorsements. So I have an endorsement in um, reading and um, high ability education. But I oh, have wow. two boys here and they were Zionsville Community School lifers. They We've lived here 20 plus years and they went to school here K through 12. And I just really love the school district and um, the philosophies that they have in education and the community, how they value education. Mm-hmm. And the kids, my, my boys did great going into college because they were so set up nicely um, with all of the AP classes that they offer when they get older into the high school years. Yeah, that's that's really what we moved here from Nevada. And that's really what kind of drew us to Zionsville. I mean, we had to come to Indiana anyways for my wife's job, but that's what really drew us to Zionsville was, was the high level of public education that they offer. And it's it's something a lot different than the typical public school you get in Las Vegas. My mom and my stepdad are teachers. They're, they're, they were teaching, they've taught for years, I don't know how many, but they were teachers out in Las Vegas. And I would hear essentially horror stories about how, you know, certain kids were, parents were, how class sizes were so overwhelmed. You know, they have mobiles outside for classrooms. My mom was teaching classes of 40 plus kids in middle school. And she taught middle school and then she was a librarian for quite a few years. And my stepdad was a, a FIED teacher 
in high school, but now they've both long retired. Now they've been retired for a few years. So yeah, it's just, it's just a interesting stark contrast between the, the level of education here in Indiana, which I, I, I don't really know why and versus the, the level of education in Nevada. It's just quite a stark contrast there. Right. I feel like uh, here in Zionsville, my boys got a private prep school education through public schools. That's kind of really? how I feel because back, well, they've been gone, um, graduated in 2011 and 2014. The, I mean, it, every year the, the, the classes get bigger and bigger, but and, and the community is continuing to grow. So it's not going to stay that way. But at least mm -hmm. um, when my boys went through, they didn't go to a humongous high school. Um, like the near, we have a nearby high school that that's like a, um, a small university. They have so right. many kids that, that go there. So, yeah, it's, it's, and, and I've noticed too, that I think, is it a Boone County? The county that we're in is Boone County and they have a, they have an extra, what is it? One or 2% tax that goes to school. So they kind of get some funding there and Zionsville is really small town. It does. I mean, it's a suburb of the big city, but it, it does have a, a small town feel. And I grew up in a small town school. I grew up with a graduating class of 92 kids. The town I lived in had 1900 people in it, you know, so that is a, that's a big deal compared to out West in Nevada too, where I think funding is in dire need out there for sure. So, right. Right. So I had this question and I've noticed this with my own daughter and that was when the year comes to a close, do you notice really any burnout going on with your kids in the aspect of learning or listening? And do you have any kind of recommendations for parents that might help minimize that burnout or increase child's engagement, you know, in, in class? Well, the closer that summer gets, you do have, um, summer fever. I mean, even teachers have it too, because you've spent so many days and, and weeks with the, the same class, especially at an elementary level. And sometimes they're, they're just ready to move on. So I wouldn't call it burnout. I just think that they're just ready to, they're to like move on and, and to have a new environment, a new teacher. And mm -hmm. so I, I, with first graders, I don't see burnout at all. Um, the younger kids, they just, that's why I love teaching first grade. They love school. They love each other. They love their teacher. But, you know, kids, just like teachers, they feel like, oh, here comes summer. And, we're, you know, kind right. of the countdown. And I don't know. I think I even feel like at the end of the year, it's like, okay, they're, they're like little um, baby birds who are ready to <laughs> fly off into second grade. Right. right. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was actually another question I had is if if you as a teacher kind of feel any of that kind of stress towards the end of the year and you're kind of like, oh, I'm ready for a break because I know when I used to be in in the working field that I would I would get burned out and I wouldn't get any kinds of breaks like kids get. And I'd, I would feel that same way about doing your same job over and over again and and not having, you know, any sort of a break. So it does make sense well, that. Uh, I'm teaching is a lot, and you know this probably because you said you have um, relatives in education, but teaching, especially in elementary, I can't talk to middle school and high school because I've never taught that, but teaching is a lot of like rhythm and routine. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you do the end of the year, you, you kind of get out of those rhythms and routines because you've got special things happening. You've got field trips or you've got, you know... Jogathon, or th you know, just yeah, yeah jogathons or <laughs> ma dance marathons and yeah. things like that 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 pop up and um, and then kids get out of their routine a little bit. So um, because of all those kind of end of the year activities, it it does kind of lend itself to that summer fever a little bit. Okay, yeah, I've, we've noticed too. Like I said with Olivia, that she was in gymnastics for from probably last summer until. February, March, and then she was in a sewing class and then she was in school on top of that. And we noticed that her her mood kind of tended to decline. And when things started getting a little bit tough in gymnastics and she wasn't able to perform things or she would injure herself, we noticed that her mood would really change. And we ended up asking her and said, hey, do you, do you still want to do this? Are you still having fun? And she said no. So we pulled her out of gymnastics and then we eventually pulled mm -hmm. her out of sewing too, just because it was the end of the sewing session. 
and her mood did drastically come around. She was she was getting very negative there for a while, and she was getting very unwilling to do things. So I think us pulling her out of some of those activities kind of changed that for her, and it, it helped her out quite a bit. Kids can be overscheduled for sure, and I learned that lesson as a parent as well. Um, kids need downtime, just, just like parents and adults need downtime. I need downtime. And mm-hmm. um, so I, I think that's great that you listened to her and pulled her out because you don't want her to have a negative connotation with gymnastics because she got frustrated or she was right. tired or because, um, you know, as a teacher, of course, I'm always going to say your first priority should be education, not soccer right. or baseball or you know, horseback riding or whatever the activity is, but, you know, and I want kids to have fun doing those things and do them if they're having fun. But if it's too much, especially during the school year um, and they're getting too tired, we will, we in the classroom as teachers will see the results of that. Mm -hmm. And it seems like a, a new, not a new trend, but it does seem trending to get kids into a ton of sports and, and let my kids do basketball and football and and whatever else and and just have them loaded with almost trying to expose them to many many different things but i think in the long run i think it could like you said it could could kind of deter them from getting a good education in school every day yeah i mean it depends on the child i had um i have like i said i had two boys and my oldest is a very high energy, high gross motor skill, like, Mm -hmm. and we had to keep him tired. So (laughs) we did probably over schedule him. But it that was but it was necessary, right? It was necessary. But, you know, my my younger son didn't need that. So we didn't have him in as many activities as my older son. So you, it's kind of a case by case basis, right? Kind of play it, play it by ear with each individual Mm -hmm. child that makes a lot of sense. So when, when kids come back to school from summer break, do you notice a significant amount of knowledge loss or can you kind of tell which kids spent time doing academic refreshing versus the kids that really didn't do that? And and how quickly do you kind of notice yeah. those differences? Oh, you can tell right away, you know, because most grade levels talk or, you know, we have sheets when they come in we know where they where a student should have been when they ended a kindergarten if they're coming into first grade and you know you kind of expect them to be like for example a reading level you 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 maybe they might drop off one level but if they've dropped off two three four levels you can tell that they didn't do much over the summer i can see it also i know that's one of your other questions about um, over breaks, winter break or mm-hmm. spring break, I can tell the kids who read or did something academic um, versus the ones who didn't. So, and I mean, it doesn't take long to, to fill in those gaps, but, and each kid is different. Like I, like I said, with my two boys, I had to just like choose your battles over the summer about how much are you going to force them to do or not force, that's the wrong word, but how much are you going to ask them to do? <laughs> right, almost force. Some, sometimes you have to force them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have the one story about my younger son. He, um, one summer, well, I guess it was after his first grade year going into second grade, he, we didn't do anything academic and they, I just like my boys to be outside. They played outside. They, you know, did outside things. They went to the pool and they rode their bikes and they played with friends and we didn't do anything. And back then the NWEA test that we put a lot of emphasis on in our Mm -hmm. school district, um, they didn't take it until second grade. Now they take it in kindergarten and first and every grade level, but he came back. He was a like outstanding first grader, but he came in to second grade, took that fall test and was like all of a sudden a below average second oh, wow. grader. And I was like, whoa, you know, that's my fault. I we didn't do anything over the summer. So that was a really good parenting lesson for me. Um, mm-hmm. and a teaching lesson, you know. So I, after that, I really do encourage parents to do something over the summer. And um I know you're going to ask me later about what some of those some things are. So yes. you want me to address that now? <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Um, it's it's uh it's interesting just to say comment on what you said earlier is how 
how you can even notice that that there is some learning loss, like let's call it when kids are on shorter breaks, that it's just very interesting to how quickly that happens when there's not that repetition there of school every day. And when they miss a week, right. you know, say for Thanksgiving or a couple weeks in Christmas, how if a child does nothing, that that will kind of start to take hold very quickly. Well, like I said earlier, the, the rhythm and routine of education, mm -hmm. um, especially in the younger grades, the rhythm is like you're moving forward. And maybe not always as quickly as some kids move faster than others. You know, it's just a developmental thing. But teaching is rhythm and routine. And then when you stop that, you know, sometimes yeah. you might slide back a little bit and then you have to get the rhythm and the routine going again. Um, right. I know our school district implemented a new break this past year, that February break. We got a whole week off in February. Right. And I, I guess I'm not a fan of that um, because I just, that break or that time, that learning from winter break until spring break is like really a crucial time. And then we like er, took a stop, you know, and once again, we roll back a little bit and then we have to get going again. Yeah, I thought I thought that break was kind of odd myself. It was somewhat of a surprise. I didn't realize it was coming up. And my wife told me, oh, yeah, they have a, a winter. A, so I don't know what the, it was called, but I a think February it was break. February. Yeah, I, I wanted I thought I read somewhere they called it dark week or something. They made it sound <laughs> like it was this beneficial thing for children. And I was like, OK, and I didn't really think much of it. But but like you just mentioned, you know, it's it's a week long backslide. And, to, and mm -hmm. then, you know, and it comes so quickly after Christmas break, essentially, and then you have a yeah. week off and then and then a month or so later, you have another week off. So, yeah, that makes a, a good point that it's just another little hiccup in the that learning curve that well, everyone. Other on. people must have felt the way I did, because we have it this coming school year. We, they kept they have it in. But after this school year, they took it back. They took it away again. Must no, have been a little we'll two be year test. Then. Yeah. So we'll go back yeah. to normal. And yeah, I don't miss that break. I don't need that break in there. I thought it was very odd that it was there. So good. I'm glad yeah. it's gone. I, so. did, I didn't need it either. And, and, you know, with spring testing, and I don't want to emphasize testing because that's not what education isn't about. Kids are, are not test scores, but mm -hmm. they still do take those tests. So that's one more week that that teachers lose to, to prepare kids or get the, the curriculum or the information to them that they need to take those tests. Um, some of those higher stake tests like in third and fourth grade where that they take the I read that they have to pass and that, that those kinds of tests. That's kind of more what I'm talking about. We okay, don't have yeah. those in first grade. All right. So how, as a teacher, how much more difficult is it to making your job balancing the different learning levels? So when you get back from summer break and then you have some students that have clearly done things and they're, they're already somewhat excelling. And then you have other students that are a little bit more challenged because they haven't done any refreshing. And how do you kind of balance that? And how do you assist some of those students that have fallen behind? Yeah. Um, I think in the last 10, 15 years of education, this big push for differentiating within a small classroom, like a, an elementary classroom has really been so great. And I know from when I think back from my first year of teaching 20 years ago till now, I mean, I, I hardly ever did like small groups. I mean, almost everything I did was whole group and now it's just the opposite. Um, that, and I love that because we can meet kids where they are using small groups. And it does take, you know, a lot of front loading at the beginning, mm -hmm. like teaching kids what to do if you're not in the group or you're not, I, you know, not, I'm not hovering over you. And, mm -hmm. and it is tricky with first graders because they're not independent, you know, at the in the fall um, right. until pro probably around, I don't know, Thanksgiving is when I feel like we kind of hit that sweet spot that, okay, they know our routine and they understand what's expected of, of them. They're starting to become, most of them, um, or if not all, have become somewhat readers. So they, they can follow the directions and try to solve their own problems if they come up when, if they're not being, if they're not meeting in the small group with me. So pretty much, um, and I, I know I'm not the only one that teaches that way. I would say 
I would say almost every teacher in Zionsville probably at, at the elementary teaches that way. There's very little whole group learning going on in the classroom. It's, it's all, not it's no longer that, that sink or swim kind of mentality of, you know, mm -hmm. someone's left behind and yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes really good sense. That's really cool. And I've been in your classroom too, and you do have tables broken up into almost little groups already. Is that kind of the purpose mm -hmm. of that too? Yes. Yes. That's and really and cool. that was hard that COVID year that we came back in 20, 2020 and 2021, where mm -hmm. we were had them sit like in straight rows with gaps in between, nobody's touching anything. Uh, <laughs> that was so hard. Like I, yeah, like I didn't realize until that year what a table teacher I am because <laughs> I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to have more than three kids at the table. And, right. I mean, that and then you, as a teacher, you know, you're not being able to contact and get close to your students and, and see what they're doing and help, you know, lean over them. And, and, you know, there's this, this, uh, kind of protocol, I suppose you have to keep in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I do, even in first grade, we do a lot of collaborative learning where like I might give a math group a problem and, and I'm like, I want you to wrestle with this problem. I don't really necessarily care about the answer. I want to see your thought process. I want to, and so a lot of times they they are talking together, having great conversations about, well, what, you know, try this or that. No, mm -hmm. I, that didn't get the right answer. Or, I got this answer. You, you got this one. It's, they're not the same. Let's go back. Um, even, I mean, kids are very capable, even at first grade of having those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that even my daughter, Olivia, being in your class over a year, how much she's she's more outspoken. She's much more, you know, talkative and and tells stories and, and tries to solve little basic problems of, of things outside and things in the house. And it's just, yeah, they they first grader is is kind of a a first grade is kind of a cool time of year or a time time span with a child. It's pretty neat. So. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it is because actually you uh, sometimes literally see the light bulb coming on for them, mm -hmm. whether it's with math or reading or um, like just even their social emotional um, needs like, oh, like you said, I mean, Olivia was a very quiet little girl at the beginning of the year and she always, you know, she was quiet all the way mm -hmm. through, but I did see her blossom and, you know, being able to insert herself into peer groups and and not be afraid to share her feelings whether it was in her small group or in her you know in, um, in a whole group setting kind of thing so um, those are the those are the great first grade teaching moments and that's why I haven't ever wanted to change grade levels that's that's really cool that's really admirable now speaking of you know you just mentioned reading books and doing math. So what are some other things that kids should be working on throughout the year? Is there any simple activities that parents can kind of do at home to facilitate some sort of fun learning for them over the summer? Yeah, I think in summer, I, that's where it should be fun. It shouldn't be like, a, okay, you've got to sit down, you've got to do your 30 minutes of reading today, because that's you know, that's no fun when it's bright and sunny out. So right. I always feel like there's, um, and I'm just a real proponent of kids being outside. I want, I want to make that clear too. Um, and no devices. I, I think pe parents should, if I were parenting today and I didn't have this issue, we're talking 20 years ago from my kids, we didn't right. have all the devices that we have now, but I would have a device-free summer. I mean, just put away... And because they're going to get that kids are going to have devices when they get older. But mm -hmm. while right now, while you can still control that while they're like in elementary school, put those away and just let them have authentic learning opportunities, whether it's I mean, there's lots of different reading you can do. I mean, you could read the back of a cereal box, right? Or there, uh, you could read directions to a, a board game. That's one thing I, I wish kids would play more board games because there's reading in board games. There's rolling two dice and adding those numbers or maybe even three dice. You know, there's math there. I love board games for kids. 
but there's just so many authentic, more authentic type of learning activities that, that you can be doing as a parent. Just be on the lookout for those. Like I'll give you the example. A couple of years ago, we were out at recess and we found the coolest. I've never seen a caterpillar like this. It was like green and big and puffy. And we took pictures of it at recess. And then you know, I think we were supposed to do math when we got inside, but we didn't. We looked up. <laughs> <laughs> what was that caterpillar? Kind of we looked it up and we learned about it. I mean, you just have to look for more of those kinds of authentic learning opportunities with with your kids, especially if they're at home. And mm -hmm. um, even just like taking their favorite sport, for instance, one, one of the activities I like to do a, at school with some of my kids is take your favorite sport and like find out how many different ways are you using math in that sport you know so like say you have a, a boy who's into football like okay you're talking about scores and that you know you're scoring two points or seven points or you know and um or you're like how many yards somebody's gaining or i mean there's just mm -hmm. so many Maybe even draw, like, um, look up and see how many yards is a football field and, how, and you know, just draw it out and do a, like a poster almost on it. So there's just lots of diff different things. And like, I always, I know parents take kids out to, to dinner, like pull out your money. Like if you have some money in a wallet or in your pocket, have them count up the money or use the menu to say, okay, well, if I order this and this, how much money am I going to need? You know, right. just see, just like pose those problems. It the one thing as a teacher and as an older parent that I uh, just drives me crazy is I go into a restaurant and I see a family of four sitting there. Mom and dad are on their phones. Kids each have their iPad. There's no conversation going. I right. I just want to go tap those parents on the shoulder and go. You know, these little people are only going to be little for a short time. And then they're going to be gone and you're, you're going to have missed it because you were on your phone or they were watching a movie when you could have been having a great little conversation at dinner. Right. So I, I, 100 I, I just agree feel with like that. if you could like look for just authentic ways of learning, wh whatever, whatever it is that you're, you're doing. Um, and then like, I know you probably know with, um, in the fall, we do wonder projects where I let a kid, the kids pick something that they're really interested in and, mm -hmm. and then just find out as much as you can about it. Now, I, I guess at the, that point, you may have to have a device or two, but, right. um, but you can also go to the library and get books too. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and how, so how often do you hear, you know, speaking of devices and stuff, how often do you hear parents saying, you know, possibly emailing you or even telling you throughout the year that, I, my kids won't listen to me when I tell them to do homework or I can't get my child engaged or, you know, whatever excuse you want to use. And I'm not going to lie. I've said those excuses as well. I've used them already probably this summer. So what do you kind of say to those parents like me that have that problem? Yeah, I like I just said, I, I think I would just tell you to look instead of like forcing it, mm -hmm. um, you know, at our school, we kind of have this no homework policy. So that's probably not a thing here in our school district, but just like, don't force it. Just like look for things that they're interested in and then try to like branch off from there, whether it's okay. nature or whether it's music or whether it's art. Um, there's just different ways. Like if, um, like for instance, your daughter, Olivia is a wonderful, very talented artist, but right? you could use that to um, have her drawing things using different shapes and then you're getting like a little geometry in there. Okay. You know, yeah. That, that makes it hundred percent. Yeah. Just like, That's you're really kind of just like sneaking it in there without them really knowing that they're <laughs> learning. <laughs> right. And it's not labeled as here's a word, you know, to give you an example, we bought, you know, we thought we were doing the right thing. We we're like, Oh, here's like a summertime gap workbook, but right. it's already titled the wrong thing. It's called a workbook. So my daughter sees that. And she automatically associates, oh, I don't want to do quote unquote learning. I don't want to, you yeah. know, sit down and do book work. So it's, that's kind of been the tough part for us. So I like that idea yeah. of, of being able to, you know, using things in nature and, and you've actually, you sent a really comprehensive list at the end of the year 
And hopefully other parents or not parents, but hopefully other teachers have done that as well. That gives mm -hmm. us many ideas for, you know, things to keep our, our child involved with the, the reading program and in counting money, like you said, and, and, you know, counting rocks outside. I don't know. And, and writing you a letter. I don't know if you got Olivia's letter or not. I, hope I did you get did, Olivia's but, letter. I so. need to write her back. <laughs> There are so many different ideas out there, more resources than when my boys were little. I guess I'm telling my age at, the, at that point, but um, like for instance, Pinterest has tons of different ideas, um, just like like STEM projects that you could mm -hmm. do. Um, at the end of the year, we did a, a special first grade bubble day where the kids were exploring bubbles and it's all so, so hands-on. Um, you should ask Olivia about it because we, we made bubbles and you don't need anything. You could, we were actually using our fingers and making like a circle with our thumb and our index finger and you could blow bubbles through that. So you don't even need anything. Um, oh, wow. That's interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, pretty cheap so, and but, pretty uh, pretty exciting for a, for a first grader anyways. Yeah, so Pinterest is a great resource. Um, there's a site that teachers use a lot, but anybody can get on there. It's not just a teacher's thing. It's called Teachers Pay Teachers. And they have tons and tons of ideas. You just type in what you're looking for, and then they I give you um, different things that ideas and you can sometimes you have to pay for them other some some of them are free um okay i i highly recommend the, both of those things but like even let's say you you do a a, tr a trip to the zoo with you know, olivia i mean there's reading there like you can read about that you know as you step up to exhibits have her read right you know the well, tell me about the polar bear see what or or read the map you know um that's that's a great skill to have too. We read a book that I love to do with the kids. It's called Bart's Charts, and he has to do the school. Bart has to do the school project, and he just figures out, oh my goodness, I can make all these different ch types of charts using things, you know, that I do. So he like made a a, a, a chart of his um, baseball and football cards he like sorted them he did okay. a chart about or um, oh he and his cousins were measuring each other one day to see who was the tallest so he made like a um a line graph with that and i mean there, you, there's just so many different things if you really stop to think about it that you mm -hmm. could make that as a learning opportunity to, that doesn't feel like learning all right, that is it for today's episode of Stay at Home Dads podcast. I know kind of an abrupt cut there, but really good conversation today, really good ideas, really good perspective. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to tune in next week to hear the rest of this wonderful conversation. There's a lot more content. There's a lot more great tips that she has in there. So please stay tuned for that. Also, if you have any questions or comments for me or even Sharon, I can relay them to her reach out to me on my social media. It is linked in the description below or pop over to podbean.com and you can probably leave a comment there. And if you can't, just go ahead and click that little follow button and that lets me know that you're listening. Anyways, don't forget to tell your friends and your family and anyone else that you talk to that they can grab this podcast on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, as well as Spotify. And that's it. And remember, tune in next week for part two of Sharon's conversation. So, all right, guys, see you later.